I do worry the impulse is perhaps an unhealthy one. You combined every other art form into, into something together. I'm trying to get as close to it as I can. It seems to be somewhat compulsive. I'm trying to be an athlete. Here I am smoking Marlboro Lights, and uh, here I am wanting to make it where those guys are on TV, and I'm not even getting close. You know, when we see a close-up on a, on a big screen, we have a biological, physiological reaction to it. And I don't, I don't even know how well we understand that yet, even, uh, you know, 100 plus years into the history of cinema. Okay. Hat, check. You're so busy playing house. At the beginning, it was just such a new adventure. But there's something magic and transporting about it, um, which can be frightening, especially when you're making documentaries because you're making something magic and transporting about somebody who's a real person. The biggest one is probably Frederick Wiseman, so which is incre incredible to be here with him. Uh, but yeah, Chantal Ackerman, uh, Douglas Sirk, Peter Watkins. Um, I I tend to think about all kinds of uh, filmmakers when I'm doing my work, and often often I obsessively think about a filmmaker and then throw those films aside and try to think about something else. Um, I used to pretend that John Cassavetes wasn't one of the most important because everyone says John Cassavetes is one of the most important, but he truly is. And, and I've realized that it's mostly because he made grown-up movies with his friends and, and they didn't feel like just movies with his friends. They didn't feel like some of the worst kinds of movies that we see today, which are just movies about people and their friends. You know, um, Now I'm making a mining Western musical reenactment movie, so we're watching a lot of John Ford and going back to Cirque again a little bit and um, and uh, and finding influence all kinds of places. Well, I grew up with very little control over my life. Um, and so when I started editing images together, I realized that I could have control in a sense. And then I realized I was afraid of that control. So I really wanted to work in documentary because there's a lack of control uh, that comes in documentary. So to me, Documentary film is this great sort of dialectical tension between control and and absolute chaos, you know, and and something about that gives me great satisfaction. It's also the medium itself, nonfiction film itself is full. There, there's an elastic quality to the medium, so you can do all kinds of things. Not that you can't do that with fiction, of course you can, um, but for me particularly, I, I don't really like writing screenplays because like, I'm not good at it, so I don't want to do things that I'm not good at. Um, but I am good at being in a room and seeing things, you know, and then trying to find ways to, to, to quote my old professor, Joseph Gomez, to externalize the internal. You know, like that's something I'm obsessed with. How do you find ways to get people to express something that they wouldn't have otherwise be able to express with a camera? When I was a kid, I used to like make up entire universes of like characters. And I had even my own fake football league where I had injuries. And like, like I, I would make up these worlds that I would want to, like control because I couldn't control real sports or, you know, my life. <laughs> so uh, making films is a way to exert some weird control over the chaotic world, you know. Um, but at the same time, I'm afraid of that. And so therefore I love documentary. I moved to New York in 2000 and uh, my future wife would try to get a drink with me. And I'd said, are you kidding? I don't have time for any social interaction because I have to go see four movies a day. And I had been a cinephile up to that point. I remember watching, I, I went, my university experience actually, I had an undergraduate professor, Joe Gomez, and another one uh, named uh, James Morrison and a couple others that just really, you know, I wrote a paper about, I remember writing a paper about uh, Rebel Without a Cause and I said something about like, you know, the color red was really important. I thought I was just bullshitting. Like that was just making it up. And then he wrote, you know, I got an A on it. And he was like, that's exactly right. The color red is really important. And I was like, oh, that's how movies work. And then moving to New York, I felt like it was just a constant overflowing of, of cinema. And I would see, you know, three, four movies in a day. Seeing, seeing uh, Jean Eustache's The Mother and the Whore, for example, or Come and See, L.M. Klimov's Come and See. Like these experiences in the Walter Reed Theater, giant 
images sitting in the third row, you know, just letting them completely overwhelm me. The first time I saw my favorite film, Peter Watkins' Edvard Munch, which remains my favorite film, even though, you know, I'm supposed to be a grown up and not have favorite films anymore, it's still, I, I cling to it. Uh, I saw a 16 millimeter print that my professor had, and I just, I didn't believe what I was seeing. And it was just sort of transformative just because something so radical, you know, you just, it, it completely upends your expectations of what movies can be. You cannot be taught how to make a film. You can meet people, you can talk about ideas, you can work through them, but you can't really be taught how to make a film. You have to go make films. You have to fail. Uh, Jonathan Oppenheim, the editor of Paris is Burning and, and The Oath and a, a bunch of other things, describes as failing up. <laughs> I think that's the best way to talk about making films is, is failure and misery and suffering and really like sort of like working through it and then finding joy and like beauty and you can't believe that you were in the right place at the right time. Those experiences, I, you know, as much as I love classroom exercises of working through theories, you got to go out and make films. I, I told my wife, I was like, she's like, well, I don't really understand what you're doing. Like, you're not going to be famous because you don't like movies that are going to make you money. And I was like, yeah, well, if I could just be like make a bunch of stuff and be respected like Frederick Wiseman or Chris Marker or something, you know, and that, w that was it. That was the goal. It was just like make movies that you don't really, or you're not embarrassed to show. It's actually really difficult to have a career of a mo movies that you're not embarrassed of because most people have to compromise to make a movie. It's, it's a financial thing. And not, so far I'm not embarrassed of anything I've ever done. I like to think that through writing and teaching and making films, me and a group of filmmakers of our generation have expanded what documentary means um, and what and what is okay to call a documentary and and even challenging viewers to think differently about it. And if we if me and others of this generation can can sort of leave our mark in that way, that'd be great. For the second, third, and fourth films, it was my uh, my sister. Uh, a cousin who was in a professional wrestling league, and I'm obsessed with professional wrestling, and then my neighbor. So it was really people very close to me, and I was so desperate to make films that it was just economically possible to make these films, and then these stories would stumble, and I became very acutely aware that you could pretty much make a film about anybody, really. And, I, and, and that was exciting, because that meant you could actually do it, and then... And then once Actress, the, the fourth of my films, a third of that I just named, kind of got out there a little bit and it was like, okay, there was some, someone finally cared about what my next film would be. I went back to some old obsessions and the Christine Chubbuck story was an old obsession. And now I'm making a film about the Bisbee deportation and that's an old obsession. I don't know. I don't, what, what happens when I run out of those obsessions? I don't know. Maybe I'd take a couple years break. You know, my kids would like that. <laughs> I, I mean, I think... Programs like this um, for filmmakers, it's, it's essential. I mean, you know, the festival circuit has sort of grown up partly because filmmakers don't have, it's, we work very hard on this work and there are people who want to see the work. I certainly struggle um, to raise the money it takes to, and then find the proper distribution, you know. And so this is a lifeblood. I mean, just being, I mean, seriously, I now work in a university myself and I just know, I knew it would work once I knew that we had a budget to pay people to come in. Because it's, it's when, if you can pay filmmakers to do anything, it just saves them. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not subtle. It's really like, if you don't get paid to, to speak or make or teach or express or something, you, you, you fall away and very quickly you stop thinking of yourself as a filmmaker and then we lose filmmakers. I mean, it's, it's that important. And, and having a space this beautiful... Uh, to actually, you know, make an event out of the 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 process of seeing a film. It's just, I mean, it's you know, it's what we it's what we do it for. I mean, I, I make films for big screens, so to walk in a place like this and know that you know, in a few hours from now, we're gonna have uh, a you know a bunch of people in the house watching it the way it's meant to be seen, and and I am not I'm being actually treated well for having made a movie. It's like it's sort of actually hard to find people to treat you well for making movies. So it's it's a very special important thing. Mm -hmm.